Good afternoon and welcome to today's CME CE activity. There is no commercial support. The speakers and planners have disclosed no relevant financial relationships with any commercial interests. You will receive a SurveyMonkey link after today's activity. If you're viewing online, we'll enter that evaluation link into the chat section. And if you're viewing after the fact, you will find it in the description section of the video. If you have a question and you're viewing online, please enter into the Q&A chat and we'll ask the presenter at the end of the session. And if you're in the room, we'll um, open up question and answer um, after the activity is over. I would like to introduce Dr. Jody Bonmiller. She is our core faculty member with our Family Medicine Residency Program here at Northeast Georgia Medical Center. Thank you, Jennifer. So I am Dr. Bond Miller. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm very excited to be here today and to open up the Diversity in Medicine series with Dr. Ren Massey. So he is a licensed clinical psychologist in private practice in the Atlanta area for over 30 years and is an adjunct assistant professor in the Emory University School of Medicine, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. He conducts psychotherapy and evaluations for children, adolescents, and adults and specializes in LGBTQ plus issues, particularly in gender identity and questioning. Dr. Massey is a fellow of the Georgia Psychological Association, the GPA, where he has served in many roles, including on GPA's ethics committee, and in 2017 and 18, he served as a GPA president. He has also served on the board of directors of the World Professional Association of Transgender Health, WPATH, and on the committee to update the WPATH standards of care for people who are transgender and gender diverse. After serving on the faculty and steering group for the WPATH Global Initial Global Education Institute, GEI, he was selected as co-chair, mental health chair, to lead the mental health and aspects of national international training and programs of the WPATH GEI. Please welcome Dr. Ren Massey. Hello there, I'm Dr. Ren Massey, my pronouns are he, him, and I want to express my appreciation to NGHS for hosting this series and having me here today. It's nice to see live faces in the audience. I know there are also folks out there in Zoom land that are going to watch this on video. I appreciate everybody watching and paying attention to these issues of transgender and gender diversity experiences. As Jennifer said, I have no financial, um, you know, financial concerns or relationships I need to disclose. I do want to thank Dr. Bond Miller for uh, talking with the CECME committee here and for the committee bringing me. I also want to thank people behind the scenes, Henry making the tech work, uh, Jennifer Reagan, Laquita Dooley, Janine Walker for taking care of details and CE, CME things, and uh, all that other stuff that makes uh, something like this possible. So here's what we're going to cover today. And I have an ambitious program. Some of my slides I may just touch on, but you will have them uh, as resources to access. Uh, but I want to give you a lot of information today. So we're going to cover some foundational information, basics of terminology, et cetera. We're also going to talk about some etiquette issues. I always think my old-fashioned Southern mother would be happy hearing me talk about etiquette. We're also going to talk a little bit about examples of how to support people who are trans and gender diverse, as well as there are going to be some resources provided in my materials. We probably won't have time to get to those, but they will be in the materials that I provide y'all. So why are we here? First, let me ask, how many of you have had patients who identify as transgender or have told you they're questioning their gender identity or maybe they have a loved one who is? Anybody? I'm seeing, looks like at least half the hands went up in the audience here. And I will tell you, if you have not had that experience, it's incredibly likely that you will, because that's what I hear from professionals around the country and around the world, is that we're seeing more and more people who need health care who happen to be transgender, and that care may or may not be related to a gender transition. You also have staff and colleagues who may be trans or gender diverse. And so we want to help you support your patients, 
as well as your staff and colleagues in living their best lives and having the best experiences and contributing to the workforce as well as possible. This is an example, I'm gonna talk about a study that is an example of why we want professionals to be well-versed and comfortable dealing with folks who are gender diverse. There are many studies like this. Hutto et al. in 2018 surveyed 150 transmasculine adults and they found that over two thirds of them reported in their lifetime that they'd been mistreated in a medical setting. So that may mean they were called the wrong name or pronoun. It may mean they were ridiculed or maybe they were refused treatment. So there are all sorts of ways. I've even heard of physical assaults in medical settings. So we don't want that to happen because then in this survey, over 40% indicated that they avoided health care within the last year. Think about that, avoiding health care. What are the consequences of that? 5% of the population in that study indicated that they then had medical emergencies. So we don't want that to happen. We want to help you all be prepared to maximize the health outcomes for every patient you work with. So to get into this, we have to go over something I call the historical ladder of assumptions. And I'm going to cover this kind of quickly, but in some aspects of healthcare and in the world, most of us are taught that there are two types of people, that there are folks who either in utero or at birth are assumed to have XY chromosomes, or maybe they're tested and have XY chromosomes, or maybe they appear to have a penis and testes. And so these people are then assigned a male gender marker. That is something that is done to them without their consent. They are assigned a male gender marker. In my world, we call that AMAB, assigned male at birth. Now, these folks are then assumed to take on the gender identity of a boy or later a man, and then also assumed to take on masculine gender role expectations, including expressions that tend to look traditionally masculine according to our culture. Also, they're assumed to be attracted to women. Similar set of assumptions made about people who appear to have or test as having XX chromosomes, they're assigned a female gender marker without their consent, a fab, and assumed to take on the gender identity of a girl or later a woman, and to engage in feminine gender role expectations and expressions, and to be attracted to men. We're gonna take a few minutes to deconstruct this ladder of assumptions that most of us are raised with, from biology classes, to society, to school settings, uh, all sorts of places where we're socialized. First, let's start with biology outside the binary. This was really helpful for me to recognize that there are individuals with common intersex conditions or DSD conditions. This means that they, uh, DSD is short for, the technical term is disorders of sex development. In my world, my field, we call this differences of sex development to indicate that variation is biologically normal and that it actually helps most species to thrive to have variation. So these are gonna be individuals who may have reproductive organs of both sexes. They may not have reproductive organs that are fully developed. They may have ambiguous genitalia. There are a number of presentations phenotypically where people will look different than typical folks who are X, have XY or XX chromosomes. So some examples of hormonal conditions are complete or partial androgen insensitivity syndrome. So this leads to the feminization or the lack of virilization or lack of masculinization of folks who have XY chromosomes. I've seen some people who have XY chromosomes with complete androgen insensitivity who uh, look like any other woman who you would have no idea that they had 
XY chromosomes rather than XX chromosomes. They may not even identify as transgender, but rather as intersex, because that is their biological reality. There are also folks who have congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which leads to the masculinization of folks with XX chromosomes. There are also chromosomal conditions, such as Klinefelter syndrome, which has multiple Xs and a Y, and there's also Turner's, where there's an X and an O. And so these are just a few of the many intersex conditions that lead to variations in people's biological appearance. Now for me, when I started studying transgender issues, it was helpful because I realized, oh, transgender issues are somewhat similar to having intersex issues or conditions that are showing up physically. So we see that the first rung of that ladder isn't accurate, that there's much more complexity than just the binary of XX and XY. Let's go down to the next rung. All of the women you see here are transgender women. They transitioned, they were assigned male at birth, and transitioned to live their lives as women. And they have been very successful, from Angela Ponce, who represented Spain in Miss Universe, to Jin Jing, who was the first official woman to transition in China, was in the military, and then became a celebrity. She's like an Oprah over in China. Lana Wachowski at the top right of the Wachowski sisters, who used to be the Wachowski brothers, brought us the Matrix trilogy, brought us um, Sense8 on Netflix, brought us Cloud Atlas and a lot of other fine entertainment. The bottom right is Isis King, an actress and model, and also we see the other picture is Martine Rothblatt. Forbes named her one of the brightest uh, business minds of the century, she formed Sirius XM. She's done all sorts of pharmaceutical and medical technology. These are examples of women whose gender marker assigned to them did not match their inner experience of their gender identity. And with support and acceptance, they have been incredibly successful in their respective fields. All right, so I picked this sign because we're all very familiar with these signs of men and women in the restrooms. I'm trying to denote here the gender roles and rules for our society are enforced in many, many ways in a very binary fashion. However, if you go to other countries or even other time periods, men may more commonly have long hair, for example, or they might wear things that look to us here in 21st century USA, they may look like dresses or skirts. So we need to recognize that there are a lot of rules and roles that are just very cultural, but there are a lot of folks who want to play with that. They don't necessarily identify with the rules and roles uh, typically um, endorsed by our culture. And so we look then at gender expression, and I like this slide. Apparently, my graphics got shrunk down in the, in the translation here, unfortunately. But uh, I like this slide because we all may want to rock our gender in different ways. And there are folks who really want to play with gender and their expression of their gender, such as Ellen DeGeneres. And you can see in this picture that, you know, you know Ellen, as far as we all know, she identifies as a woman, assigned a female gender marker at birth, as far as we know, and yet she often dresses in masculine attire, and she's been very successful and popular. This is a picture of Billy Porter, who was on the Netflix series Poses and has been in a number of other movies, and in this picture, Billy Porter, a gay man, is wearing this amazing gown that blends masculine and feminine features. And so both of these folks are kind of disrupting several rungs of the ladder because they're both gay and playing with their expression of their gender. So let's go back to that ladder of assumptions, which we now need to think of as heteronormative assumptions, that there are only binary men or women, boys or girls, and that people are always attracted to the, quote, opposite sex. And we're going to clarify this a little bit. 
we need to think in a nuanced way that the top rung of things, that has to do with people's genetics and biology, which can be totally separate from their legal label, the gender marker that's assigned to them, or that they legally change at a later date in the states and the countries where that is allowed. That gender marker or the biology can be totally separate from somebody's inner experience of their gender identity, which can also be separate from their social presentation as we saw with Ellen and Billy Porter. And then finally, we need to recognize people's attraction to people is totally independent of their gender identity and how they may express their gender as well as independent of their biology. So I just want to be clear. That ladder of assumptions, it, it exists because it's true for the vast majority of the population. It's probably true for at least 90% of the population. Well, about 90%. There are surveys that would suggest somewhat even more folks that it may not apply to. But I would guesstimate around 90% of the population that ladder of assumptions works. But 10% of the population, it doesn't fit for people who are LGBT, lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. You only also hear Q for queer or questioning, intersex, asexual, and other situations. So what is the estimate we have for folks who are trans and gender diverse? The WPATH, World Professional Association for Transgender Health, uh, wrote the standards of care uh, version eight, I'm gonna talk about that a little more later. And in that we see that population estimates for adults in the US and most many cultures is about 0.5% that are definitely identified as transgender. And then we've got up to four and a half percent in major surveys identifying as gender diverse or trans. When we look at younger folks, youth, we see even higher percentages. 1.2 to almost 3% identifying as transgender, and then including all transgender diverse uh, folks, we've got up to over 8%. And that's a lot of people. If you think about the metro Atlanta area, 6 million people, that means at least 60,000 are, are transgender and about 120,000 more safely, we can say are gender diverse. So that's a lot of the population we don't want to miss. Working with this population, there is an evolving vocabulary. We're going to cover some basics first. Transgender is an umbrella term most people you probably know. That means people's gender identity doesn't align with the gender marker assigned to them at birth. So they have a different experience that is not congruent with the social expectations that go with that gender marker assigned at birth based on that ladder of assumptions. The best known types of transgender folks are women. That is, I showed you a slide of a number of women. Formerly that used to be called trans, uh, male to female or M to F. Nowadays, more commonly, we may say trans woman or woman or medical documentation sometimes may be AMAB. Um, so the other major category are folks who transition female to male. We now mostly call those folks men or trans men. Um, sometimes they've been denoted as F to M, but more commonly nowadays we use the denotation AFAB or assigned female at birth. The majority of the population, as I mentioned, is cisgender, meaning the gender marker aligns with what was assigned uh, their inner experience and the expectations that come with, with the gender marker assigned at birth are ones that they kind of live with and feel relatively comfortable with. Now, because I work with a lot of young people, I'm also often schooled by them about new terminology I need to adopt and be aware of. And there's uh, some umbrella terms I want to familiarize y'all with for ways people can be gender diverse or expansive. Gender nonconforming is not used that much now, but you sometimes see it denoted GNC. And, you know, I don't know that Ellen identifies with this term, but Ellen and Billy Porter showed ways of being gender nonconforming because they weren't doing dressing in traditional manner for their gender marker and gender identity. 
gender fluid are folks who their energy, their experience of their gender identity may flux during a day, during a week, over weeks or months. And so there's some fluidity to their experience. And I'm seeing a few more of these folks. Gender queer describes folks who don't relate to the binary. They don't identify with either of those terms. And sometimes there's actually an intentional effort to um, kind of rebel or push against the socio-political expectations of men and women or boys and girls. The more common term you've probably heard nowadays is non-binary. You may be denoted in B or spelled out in B, gender non-binary. These are folks who may not identify with either of those binary man or woman identities. They also um, may identify with both of them. They may identify as something else altogether. So these folks are often folks who have additional stressors because in our culture, we're still very, you know, binary thinking. I will say at least I'm, I'm north of a certain age. I'll disclose more later. Uh, and, you know, we grew up in a very binary world. The younger folks have a little more flexibility in how they're seeing things and thinking about gender and sexuality. But these non-binary folks, non-conforming folks often have more stressors because there is less comfort with things that do not fit into our binary expectations. And sometimes they have more victimization. You may encounter these people and they may not want a gender transition. They may not want a social transition or medical needs, but it may be really important to them that you use the pronouns they identify with, like they, them. And we'll talk more about pronouns in a little bit. So, before we go further, I want to tell you a little bit about how I got into this field. Um, so I'm taking a little detour in my talk because my, my professional life took a little bit of a detour. And I got here, you know, I, I did my graduate work in the 1980s. And there was not a lot being done on transgender health or education about transgender folks and their needs uh, when I was in graduate school in the 80s. But I grew up in the 1960s and 70s. I was born in 1962, and I'll be 62 this year. And um, I was always interested in the women's liberation movement at that time because it was critical of the limitations and the rules for girls and women as well as for the limitations and rules of men and boys. I think that I was so interested in it because I was assigned a female gender marker at birth. I was raised as a girl. Now, I was really fortunate. My parents, I mentioned my mother was an old fashioned Southern woman and my dad was a military man, Navy officer. I was lucky because they thought it was cute that I was a tomboy. And so it was okay that I was going and playing football or marbles or riding bikes or Hot Wheels and toy cars, you know, with uh, other little boys. They didn't know I was a little boy at the time. But they thought that was fine and it was okay. But when I reached middle school, I started feeling social pressure to girl up, if you will. And in high school, I felt even more of that pressure to try to conform to the social expectations. And I tried growing my hair out and doing things that other girls were doing, but it was really uncomfortable. And I didn't have words to explain it, why I didn't feel comfortable and why it just didn't feel normal to me. To I, I knew something was different, but I didn't know what because there was not this amazing thing we have now called Google that so many young people and their parents and adolescents and teenagers, adults, are looking up, why am I feeling this way? What is this? And that didn't exist back in the dark ages of the 1960s and 70s, uh, at least not that I had had any access to. And so in high school then, I started recognizing, oh, and I'm attracted to other, other girls. And I was like, oh, maybe that also explains why I feel so uncomfortable. 
and different. And I just want to invite you for a moment to think about this person having to go into the girl's locker room. Think about this person having to be in a girl's restroom. It was very uncomfortable. Now, the straight guys might be thinking, oh, that would have been great when you're a teenage boy. But it felt wrong. I like, I feel like I'm someplace I'm not supposed to be, but I can't say why. I don't understand why. I don't want to look at anybody. I don't want anybody looking at me. I don't want to talk to anybody in here. And so it was, I was fortunate. I was, you know, interested in my academics and I focused on my academics a lot. And so I went through, you know, college and graduate school. And in my 20s, while I was in graduate school working on my PhD, I came out as a lesbian. And I say that, you know, kind of with a smile on my face now because it's kind of amusing when I look at this face in the mirror to think about that prior incarnation. But remember those conservative parents and traditional parents I mentioned? There was a lot of conflict with me and my parents when I came out as a lesbian. And that was the best sense, the narrative that I could make uh, to make sense of my life and my experience at that point. So it was a lot of challenges, but eventually things settled down with them. And, you know, I came to Georgia after finishing graduate school and set up my practice and got involved with the Georgia Psychological Association, GPA, and became known in the community for doing educational work and therapy and providing services a lot, specializing in LGBT folks. And then, you know, in the next two decades into my 40s, I just kind of kept cutting my hair shorter than I'd grown out to the middle of my back in college. And I was dressing more and more masculine. And I looked, you know, I would have worn this kind of suit even before my gender transition. But in my 40s, I was like, something is missing. And my life was quiet and calm. And I got to hear the inner voice saying, something's missing. I got to do something about this. So I engaged in my own counseling. I did a lot of prayer and meditation and journaling and reading and got in touch with that I needed to explore this masculine side of me. And the more I stepped into this, the more I was like, oh, this is right. And I, I was not thrilled about this. Let me tell you, I was like, oh, I think there's something here. Oh, no. I mean, I'd already been through one coming out. That was enough. Thank you very much. But it was like every step I took, I felt better and better. And so, spoiler alert, I underwent a gender transition. And, you know, it's a little embarrassing because even as a professional, like I'd heard of transsexual or transgender. Most people now like the term transgender better. I had made a different narrative to make sense of my life. So I was a late bloomer getting to it in my 40s. And yet, I'll tell you, it's more stressful coming out as trans because you have to tell everybody in your world if you want to transition in place and keep your world around you intact. So that meant not just telling my partner of a decade and my close friends and family. It meant telling, oh, let's see, my accountant who I trusted to do my taxes for years. It meant telling my office landlord who I was going to keep paying the rent for. It meant telling my dental hygienist and dentist because I trusted them with my teeth. It meant telling my auto mechanic because I trusted them with my car. And I needed them to know that, yes, this is still going to be me bringing in my car, my taxes, etc. And I'm just going to be looking and sounding a little different. As stressful as it was, I was incredibly fortunate to be met with a lot of social support. I was really worried about my business life. Was my practice going to collapse? Would people think I was a freak? What was, what was the response going to be? And I was met with a ton of support 
And in fact, because I had a reputation for being willing to dig in and get work done, in 2012, a couple of years after my medical transition had started, they then asked me to run the annual conference for GPA. And I did that, and fortunately I had the support of a great volunteer committee and staff, and it was a sellout, and was very successful. And I was going to work really hard on it because I didn't want to be the first transgender person to chair the conference and not have it go well. And it did go really well, and so then they asked me to run for president of GPA. So in 2012, I declined. But in 2016, I was nominated again, and that time I accepted the nomination to run for president of GPA. And I'm so glad I did, because when I was elected and then served as the president of GPA, I was able to discover talents I didn't know I had and abilities I didn't know I had. I was able to run board meetings, even make them fun, which is not a small task. I was able to represent the public of Georgia's mental health needs at our state legislature and at the federal legislature. I was able to meet people and do all sorts of things and solve problems that I never would have had the opportunity to do before. And what I recognized was that in my prior incarnation, I still had so much energy tied up in this unsolved puzzle of what was missing in my life and what was wrong and what was uncomfortable in me and not authentic, what was incongruent. But when I took those steps, my life was so much easier. And I'm, I'm not saying that it was easier because I became a man. I'm saying it was easier because it was authentic, because transgender women will tell you the same thing, that it's easier for them to be themselves fully and to live authentically. Now, I'm going to tell you about telling my family, and I save that for the last because it's hardest. Because I was terrified that if I'd had that much conflict about coming out as a lesbian, that I would totally lose them. And I wrote them all letters with a lot of love and information to help them explain and give them a chance to call when they were ready to contact me and talk about it. And I can remember where I was when my mom called. And I'm in my 40s at this point, my parents in the 70s. And my mom said, your dad had to go to his barber shop quartet rehearsal. But he said to say, hello, son. And that meant the world to me. And it still does. You can see I'm in my 60s, and it still matters this much to me, that even before I had done any medical surgical interventions, I was being affirmed by my family and supported and seen. Ironically, I think that that ladder of assumptions worked for me because to them then I was no longer their daughter breaking all the rules for a woman. I was now just a dude doing dude stuff. And I made more sense to them in their binary, heteronormative, assumptive ways. I share this story because not everybody has the gift of support, but it makes such a world of difference. And if it makes this difference to me at this age, and it still matters to me this much, and it I didn't share this part, but it dealt, it, it fixed so many issues. There had been still some remaining conflicts with my parents, and they dissolved. 
it's like everything made sense to everybody now, and it just fixed so many problems. When people don't get that kind of support, this, this graph shows, this diagram shows the black bars are higher rates of ending up in homelessness, sex work, or making suicide attempts for people who are rejected by their families. And the sad thing is that even with family rejection, the rates are high. Almost a third of the folks even that are not rejected outright attempt suicide who identify as trans and gender diverse. This data is from the US Trans Survey, which was published in 2016 based on over 27,000 adults in the US, 18 and above who were surveyed and responded to a number of things. I'm going to cover some data points. They did another collection of data in 2022 at the end of the year. So we don't yet have the results, but I'm eager waiting for uh, those to be able to talk about those as soon as they come out. So now I want to talk a little bit to clarify gender and sexual orientation issues. So I get parents who come to me with their kids, and they often say, can't my kid just be gay? And I say, well, let me explain this to you. And, and it kind of cracks me up a little bit, because in the 1990s when I started my practice, they would never have been saying that. But now at least this is what they're saying. Can't they just be gay? And I explain to parents, well, your kid can be cisgender, meaning their gender identity aligns with the gender marker assigned at birth, and can be gay, lesbian, straight, bi, pan, poly, etc. Guess what? You can also be transgender and be all those things. So, for example, there are transgender guys who look like me, who are attracted to men, so they are now gay trans men. They are gay men. There are transgender women attracted to women. They are lesbians. I, in my prior incarnation was seen as a lesbian because I was attracted to women. This incarnation, I'm still attracted to women, and now I'm a straight white dude. I did not see that coming in my lifetime. I add this last slide just because folks who are non-binary may not always identify with these labels um, because their gender uh, may be different, and so it, the terms gay, straight don't necessarily fit, although bi, pan, poly, those terms are applicable regardless of who somebody's gender is because it's about who they're attracted to. Now, it's important to recognize this. People ask, is it a choice? Steve Rosenthal is one of our um, faculty with the WPATH uh, Global Education Institute, or GEI, and he is a pediatric endocrinologist well-known at UCSF. He is, I believe, on the board of the Endocrine Society, and he did a couple of reviews of articles, uh, many articles on this topic, and found some fascinating things. There is not 100% concordance in identical twins, but there's a much higher rate of both identical twins in a pair transitioning or being gender diverse than you would expect, expect with dizygotic twins or when you find with other siblings. I find it fascinating that it's not 100%. I have worked with four identical twins. A couple of them I worked with both in the pair. Others I did not work both in the pair. And all the pairs that I worked with, both people transitioned. They didn't always transition at the same time. So I do wonder if the survey involved in these studies were done at a later time, maybe it'd be there is a higher concordance rate. But we see a high, very high concordance rate in um, identical twins transitioning. Additionally, we see a higher percentage of folks who are intersex identifying as trans. So when we have hormonal or chromosomal variations, there is a higher probability of being transgender. 
And then I find this last point fascinating, that there are similar brain structures for the folks that people identify as, the gender they identify with, even before any hormonal or surgical interventions. Even before any medical interventions, there are brain structures from fMRIs that are more similar to the gender folks identify with. It's fascinating. So this all suggests that we've got a lot of evidence of biological factors and determination in gender identity, but we need more research to understand completely the nature-nurture kind of interaction. Personally, I think of gender identity a lot like handedness. Most of us need a nanosecond to tell us which is our right hand or our left hand you know, at this point in our lives. Uh, I mean, which hand, hand we're dominant with. I'm right-handed for sure. And, you know, there's a minority of people who are left-handed and some folks who are ambidextrous. I know if I'm going to do something with my right hand, it's going to be much easier, smoother, look better, be more coordinated, efficient, effective, etc. If I do it with my left hand, it, it's going to be awkward, frustrating, difficult, not pretty, and so it's not the best hand for me to use. We do not know, last time I looked last year, I checked again, we don't know what explains handedness for sure. I think it's like gender identity, but I sure know which gender feels right to me and which one felt wrong to me and which one I'm doing better in. This is a good time to mention the ICD. In the US, we're still using the ICD-10, but the World Health Organization released the ICD-11 in 2022. And in this, gender dysphoria doesn't exist anymore. Rather, it's gender incongruence, and it's in the sexual health chapter, not the mental health chapter. And it's going to be a while before the U.S. Trans, uh, transitions to the ICD-11 because it means a lot of computer and insurance coding and stuff has to go on um, to be updated. But I think that just like homosexuality was taken out of the DSM back in the 1970s, gender dysphoria is going to be taken out of the DSM in the near future, and then hopefully in the next version. From the U.S. Trans Survey, of those adults, over three-fourths indicated they were mistreated or assaulted in their kindergarten through 12th grade years. Think about that. They were called the wrong name, called the wrong pronoun, made to use the wrong restroom, locker room, wrong uniform, or they were verbally assaulted, attacked, ostracized, physically assaulted, sexually assaulted by other students, by faculty, and by staff. It's no wonder that 17% left school. It's a horrible experience. Many of them tell me about this. And about a fourth of these adults indicated they had the same kind of mistreatment in college or technical school. What are the consequences of this, of dropping out of school? We're going to run into employment issues then because people don't have job skills. This this uh, table shows the top row is the U.S. population at large when I, this survey was done. 14% were living in poverty, 5% were unemployed, and 0.3% had HIV infection. Of the U.S. trans survey, all the respondents in the next line, we see over double the rates of unemployment, triple the rates of, I mean, double the rates of poverty, triple the rates of unemployment, and almost five times the rate of HIV infection. We see higher rates of these issues, even worse with people of color. And that's because of intersectional issues. When people are experiencing a number of intersecting identities of being in a minority group, then it's harder for them to access things like education, Privilege, they're going to have more ways that they can be discriminated against. And so I want you to think about the difference between me, a white person transitioning, and I actually was gender nonconforming and probably faced more harassment or hassles before my transition to now looking like a straight white 
guy assumed cisgender. And people have said to me, by the way, all sorts of racist, homophobic, sexist, transphobic things that I, in theory, knew people said, but people make assumptions about me now um, and about my values or my experience or my way of being in the world based on my appearance. So that gives me what is called passing or blending privilege, where I have a lot of safety in the world, but folks who are people of color or who don't have the same kind of features, who don't uh, blend as well, they are going to encounter more experiences of discrimination. And it's gonna be harder for them to make it in the world and to have successful experiences in job settings and other settings. So in healthcare settings, it's also gonna be, we need to think about the age of people coming out or in our offices, we need to think about their religious experiences and background, what kind of social setting are they in. There are some settings that are more supportive than others. And there are a number of factors we need to take into account when we're thinking about our patient's identities. This is really sad to me that a lot of people in the trans survey reported rejection by their faith communities. That also we had reports in the survey, almost half indicated that in public settings, if they were perceived read as transgender, they did not have privilege of blending in. They were verbally harassed, almost half of them. And then about 14% were verbally assaulted or were denied, excuse me, denied equal access to treat, to um, using a restroom, to using their credit card, to coming into a store. 10% reported physical assault and 10% reported sexual assault. What do you think are the consequences of these kinds of experiences? This is minority stress is what these things cause. I'm gonna tell you about that. Minority stress is something that any member of any minority group experiences because they encounter chronically over their lifetime and through other people they know, they get negative interpersonal experiences of discrimination, stigma, and then they internalize that stigma. I hear people say transphobic things who don't know I'm trans. Then I get to have a conversation or figure assess the situation. People tell me about their experiences. This stresses people out. This takes a toll on feeling physically and emotionally safe in the world. And so this minority stress causes physical and mental health concerns. Big risk factors are isolation, lack of knowledge, and lack of social support. So the antidotes, our protective factors, are providing information, getting people connected with community, getting people connected with information. Dr. Bon Miller has done an amazing job connecting folks with resources, and that is what we as healthcare providers need to do to get them information and resources, and we can be that support. So I don't wanna get political here, I just am talking about a reality. There have been, if you pay any attention to the news, many bills in the United States. 2018, there were only 41 bills that were anti-LGBT rights. Now, over the last years, up to 2023, we had over 500 bills in the United States, and half of them were aimed at trans people. This is a map from the middle of 2023 of all the states with anti-trans healthcare and rights legislation. And that includes, unfortunately, our state, which has limited the care available for youth. I'm not gonna cover this whole study, but this study came out, it was done in 2021, interestingly enough, published last year 
on negative health impacts. And they talk actually a lot about the mental health impacts from the stressors, the distress, the suicidal thoughts, and the fear and anxiety of many of the trans people who answered their survey. But I want to give you examples of minority stress affecting physical health. When people have negative experiences in public settings, in the US trans survey, over half of the folks, 59% indicated they avoid public restrooms. Think about that, avoiding public restroom. How do they do that? Almost a third do it by avoiding food and drink during the day. I don't know about you, I don't function so well when I'm not well fed or hydrated. What does this lead to? 8% indicate that they then had health care complications as a result. UTIs, kidney infections. I knew a mom whose kid had to go to the emergency department for uh, impacted bowels for avoiding the restroom. So there are some really serious health consequences when people don't feel safe in the world. So WPATH, we've mentioned in the Global Education Institute, WPATH is known for the standards of care in our biennial symposium, which is going to be this year in Portugal, by the way, September. Come on, y'all. Um, we also have the International Journal of Transgender Health and then the Global Education Institute, and I'm the mental health chair. We have had the great experience of having in-person and online training reaching about 7,000 people in about 60 countries. Now, WPATH, I mentioned the standards of care. WPATH has been around since 1979. The standards of care, the most recent version, SOC 8, came out September 2022. And it is quite a volume of work. There's over 60 pages of references. And there are chapters on primary care, reproductive health, adolescents, children, um, hormones, surgery, and more. So there's a lot of guidance. There's inst working on institutions. There's education. There are recommendations in here for all these areas. And these were agreed upon by over 120 contributors from, I think it was 18 countries around the globe. And it was based on evidence reviewed, including independent reviews by Johns Hopkins. So this is not just a bunch of opinions. This is science coming to you. And it's available free at WPATH.org. It's important to know that every major medical and mental health association in the US has either its own guidelines or endorses the, that are compatible with the WPATH standards of care, or they have their own um, guidelines. By the way, the WPATH standards of care are what most insurance companies use. So um, that's another reason to have your hospital uh, and healthcare systems aware of it and utilizing it. This is just like a, a few snapshots from the education chapter recommending all members of the healthcare workforce be educated on trans and gender diversity issues, as well as treating people in institutional environments and making sure that we call people the right names and pronouns and that we let them use the grooming and the housing that best fits them. So there's a lot more in here that I don't have time to cover today, but I want you to know about. Finally, the World Health Organization and folks who do this work talks about things like social transition. Social transition means people changing their name, their pronouns. It may be a change of hair, their clothes, their makeup, jewelry, etc. It can be very stressful if you have a patient or a colleague going through this. Puberty blockers are another step that are useful for some youth. Georgia does allow puberty blockers for youth, for people under 18. Gender-affirming hormones are needed by some people who are transitioning. In Georgia, that's only allowed for people over 18. Um, some people who I was working with, actually their families moved out of the state so that their kids, when they hit the age of needing hormones, would be able to get them. They didn't want to have to worry about it. Um, 
If anybody started hormone therapy before July 1 of last year, you may still encounter minors who are on hormone therapy. There are many surgeries. It's too many to go over right now, but um, these are typically provided to adults. They're not allowed in Georgia anyway now for anybody under 18, but there are older teens who sometimes avail themselves of surgeries. There are also legal documents that people need to change. So there is a lot that goes on in a transition process. And if you're supporting your patients or your staff or colleagues, they need time and finances and access to all of these things. All right, we're wrapping things up here in a few minutes. Pronouns matter. So I mentioned pronouns earlier. They then very common among people who are non-binary identified. But I also encourage you that even if somebody comes to you and they don't look like the pronoun that they ask you to call them, please call them the pronoun they want. And this is, um, it was the word of the year in 2019, they, them. And it's also approved in major style guides like the American Psychological Association style guide, the singular use of they. So I promise you can get used to it if it's uncomfortable. It, it gets easier with time. We all, we're all trainable. I have faith in all of this. So, um, here's why it's important to use pronouns. This is just one of many studies that shows this. Russell and all et al. did this study showing over 100 youth between ages 15 to 21 had reduced symptoms of depression, suicidal ideation, and suicide attempts when they were called the right names and pronoun. And the amazing thing about this research is that this was a dose-dependent response. The, they, test, they asked about four different settings, and the more settings people were called the right name and pronoun that they identified with, the greater the reduction in symptoms. This is a free intervention. So I hope that if it doesn't exist now that your healthcare systems can start integrating using names and pronouns. The tricky thing I'm gonna advise here is that sometimes young people are not out to their parents. They're not ready to be out. And so you need to talk with a young person about if this is something that they want discussed with their parents or how to discuss that with their parents when they're able. All right, so I encourage you to look at this, look at your profession, see how it may uh, apply, how the standards of care may be helpful. Think about ways you can apply pronoun usage and help people who are your patients, your staff, your colleagues, and also maybe even think about things like your signage. This is gender-inclusive bathroom signage from a, a facility in the metro Atlanta area. You can also put signage in your office if you want to signal. The top flag is the trans pride flag, the bottom is the rainbow or um, broader LGBT flag. So I have slides on support and etiquette and resources, but I have a couple minutes left. I know some of you may have to leave at noon. I'm also willing to stay a little bit late if uh, people have questions. So I thank you for being here today and for your attention and your interest in this topic. Thank you, Dr. Massey. If you're viewing online and have a question, please in enter it into the chat and we'll ask that for you. Are there any questions or comments in the room? Let me toss one thing out while you're walking over there. Okay. Sometimes you're gonna slip on names and pronouns. It happens. Just apologize and move on, by the way, okay? It's, it's not the end of the world. When people know you're trying, that's all that matters, okay? All right. Hey, Dr. Massey, thank you so much for speaking to us. I'm a resident with internal medicine, and so really appreciate you coming to talk to us and sharing your story, and thank you. Um, my question is, so on social media, especially TikTok, I guess the trend now is seeing people who have trans... Uh, uh, change genders, but now regret the decision. Um, and they're all over TikTok spreading their story. So my question is, do you feel like there should be a hard stop to youth or minorities who want to make that decision, uh, whose brains 
haven't, you know, fully developed making that decision. And obviously their parents are involved, but still. So I'm trusting everybody could hear because you had a microphone. Uh, I think that the vocal folks who are talking about detransitioning are a very, very small minority. There's a lot of studies about this. 1% approximately of folks detransition. And believe me, surgeons, primary care docs, folks who prescribe hormones as a therapist, I don't want to help anybody go toward doing something that is not helpful for them and that they then regret or have to undo later. That is the exact opposite of what I want or anybody who is doing this work. It concerns me that these folks who detransition and then are very vocal, many of them had experiences where people did not follow the WPATH standards of care. And that is the bigger issue. If people are following the WPATH standards of care, it's very methodical. I am very thorough and take a very slow approach uh, about helping people transition. And in fact, people come to me, parents come to me with their kids because I have the reputation for being very methodical and thorough. So what I would encourage is just make sure that people are working with folks who go by the WPATH standards of care, and then we're gonna have very, very few people who have regrets. I will also add that the vast majority of people, there's, I didn't have time to talk about this, but in the US Trans Survey, the vast majority of people who talk about having to detransition often did it because of lack of social support or job issues. So it's a very small, small percentage of people, like 1%. So. Okay, next question. Thank you for asking that. It's an important question. Any other questions or comments? Yep, right down here. We had a comment from online that said, great presentation, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm the Family Medicine Program Director for the residency program, so a colleague of Jody's. And I, I feel like we're all in a learning curve. Mm -hmm. And in terms of written language um, that is gender inclusive. Do you have a recommendation for a guide for somebody like me that doesn't, maybe I'm thinking about it, but not really sure exactly how to do that when I write policies or for residents or curriculum? Yeah, good question about how to use inclusive language. I think a lot of people are nowadays using they or their or them. Um, to be more inclusive and uh, otherwise, I, I've written documents with he, she, they. Um, it gets a little cumbersome. Uh, I wish I had like a one button on my computer that I could that just poof all those words out at once. Um, I wonder also if AMA or family uh, medicine has uh, guidelines maybe to suggest. So I see no. Um, I, they, them seems kind of more inclusive than I've seen a lot of folks defaulting to. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Massey. It's a pleasure. Thank you.